someone in the foyer, I said, most people, most men at least, their voice changes once in their life. Mine does it once a year. <laughs> it's usually about this time of year I go full bullfrog. Um, so we're going to try to get through it together. Hopefully it'll hang on just long enough for me to finish the sermon this morning and then we'll go from there. Um, we're in Revelation 17 this morning. If you're following along in our study, hopefully you had some chance to read through it. Um, if you're a person that avoids Bible reading because it's boring, I've got the class for you. It's called Revelation. <laughs> All right, this is, and this is one of the more colorful chapters in the book. Uh, very, very loaded with imagery, with symbolism, and most importantly, using uh, structures and ideas from previous uh, judgments that God has pronounced against different cities to describe now this city of Babylon. Uh, and the description here is of a great prostitute riding a, a fantastic beast. And the things that happened to her, we're going to talk about what all that means, hopefully, in just a second. Let's offer a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, look at the, where this comes from in our text. Kind Father in heaven, we thank you for this, so much for this good morning. Father, it's a beautiful day. We are so very thankful you've given us the, the health and the means and the safety to be able to be here this morning, Father. These are things that... We use on a daily basis, and it's easy to take them for granted. We thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the chance to study your word. Father, we have your word because you have revealed it to us. You and your wisdom and in your love have revealed your mind and your will to us. You've shown us that we have purpose. You've shown us that we have you to thank as our creator. You've shown us what to do with our lives. We thank you for this opportunity. Father, as we study Revelation this morning, help us to dive into the text. Help us not to be afraid of your word or to just try not to understand it because it's written differently than other parts. Help us to take this and see it from the perspective of those who read it for the first time and understand the message that you were giving to them and understand the lessons and the principles that are there so that we can apply these things in our own situation. Father, we're mindful of the fact that we fall short before you, we sin, we ignore your law, we forget we are weak creatures. We beg your forgiveness, Father. You and your love and grace sent Jesus to, uh, to us to die and to give himself as a sacrifice for our, our behalf. And Father, we could spend the rest of our lives thanking you and it would still be insufficient, but we are not going to stop. Thank you for Jesus. In his, his name we pray. Amen. All right, so I want to kind of back up 10,000 foot view, 5,000 foot view, and then down at the text level, where we are, what's happening in this section of Revelation. Uh, this is the highest view of Revelation you can take. What's happening in the book as a whole? It's not really helpful to tell us what it's about. It's just the way the book itself is set up. There are four big sections in Revelation where John says, I was in the spirit and something happened. Okay, That's a very common prophetic uh, statement. The prophets did that all the time. They would say, I was in the spirit, and this is what I saw, or this is what I heard, or this is what happened to me. In Ezekiel's case, that happened to him a lot. <laughs> this happens four times in John's gospel. The first one is the vision of the, the seven churches, and him being giving a message to each one to carry to them. The second one is of the throne of God. It begins in chapter 4. The third one we just finished, and then there's sort of a, from 12 to 16, there's sort of a break in the middle where John says he sees three separate things, and we just got done with that. We're about to start the third one this morning. And the third one really centers on this, this enemy that God's people have, this here that's identified as Babylon, and then the enemy being judged. We've seen this before in Revelation. We've seen it a, a few times already. Uh, there was the pouring out of the seventh bowl. There was the blowing of the seventh trumpet. There was the seventh seal before those two, all pointing to final God dealing with, with evil and with sin. And in this chapter, we get the most detailed description of that. It's a description that's symbolic, is the way we have to read it, too. It's not, well, that sounds familiar. You want to know, it, it, listening to your own voice is, is, is hard to do. Um, we didn't know you were Van Poelquist. I know, I, you know, I just, me neither. But... The section is more detailed, but it is also more symbolic, and we have to read it through that lens. Okay, because there are some things in the chapter that don't make sense if you're reading it literally. But when you understand the images behind it and the symbols, then it makes a lot more sense. Um, here's how this particular section goes. 
We're having a, a enemy described as a harlot. That's not anything uncommon in the Bible. Uh, the harlot Babylon is judged in chapter 18 and there's rejoicing over her judgment. And then we're introduced to the other woman in this section. There's two women that are sort of highlighted here. We get more time on the first one and then we're going to be introduced to the second. The vision concludes with visions of judgment uh, against the beast, against the devil, and against those who follow those two. There at the end, end of chapter 20. Here are the two women we're dealing with in the chapter. We're going to talk about the first one primarily today. We have the Babylon, or Babylon the harlot, the great prostitute, it says in 17 in verse 1, or the great harlot, it might say in your version. She's riding the beast that we've been introduced to already in Revelation. And then a little later, chapter 19, we're introduced to the bride, okay, or the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who are we talking about with that, in that reference to that woman? If the first woman is Babylon, evil, wickedness, so on, who's the second? Yeah, the other side. Right? So, as John does this a lot in his writings anyway. When you read John, it's very black and white, right? Sheep and goats, right hand, left hand, you know, wheat, tares, lots of that kind of going on. And the same thing happens here. There are the evil ones, and then there are the good ones. And you see the evil ones in chapter 17 and following. When you read 17, and Lord willing, you read it uh, sometime before the last eight minutes, what did you see when you read it? All right. What stood out to you? Can't say it wasn't interesting. Okay. <laughs> what stood out to you? Yes, sir, Mark. First one. One thing is that this image of the, the beast and the woman, it's interesting to me that it was in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. See, in the wilderness, this thing, this image. Okay. So this is being, the woman is seen, she is seen riding the beast in the wilderness in verse 3. Now, someone other than Mark, why is the wilderness a bad place? Or what, what, what gives us the idea in Scripture that the wilderness is a not great place to be? The 40-year wandering? Yeah, the whole 40-year wandering in the wilderness part, right? The wilderness was the bad place they had to go between Egypt and the, and the Promised Land. It's called the wilderness of sin. It doesn't mean sin. That's just the name of the place. But anyway, there's the whole 40-year wandering. So the wilderness is seen as a wicked place. It's seen as an evil, dangerous place. Um, in Exodus 16, you might remember the Israelites, they accused Moses of bringing them out into the wilderness to do what? To die. To kill them. To, to, you know, you've brought us out into this great wilderness to die. So they're bad, bad juju, okay, in the wilderness. Any others? I've got a couple more, but we can move on. What I've got underlined in this chapter is verse 14. Oh, okay, yes. Well, what about verse 14? <clears throat> The lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of Lords, and he is king. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the people represented in this, in, in this um, woman, I think, they are going to make war on the lamb, and the lamb's going to conquer them. He's going to win. Lord of Lords and King of Kings, that's not, one of those is sort of common, but together, not very often, right? That's a very unique expression, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Um, yes, and then one more over here. Yep. Uh, then... It's the same thing with verse 14. When I've studied Revelation in the past, uh, the person who was leading the study said this is basically the thesis statement of the entire book. I can see that. Verse 14. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you get confused by everything happening in it, just go back to this, and that's that's the important part. Yeah, that's the that's the the one line sentence at the you know beginning. It's the this is what happens in the book. Interesting also in verse 14. Those, those with him who are called and chosen and faithful, right? Called, chosen, faithful. Called means someone called out to you. Chosen, what would that imply? Selected. You were selected. Those who are called, but I thought they were, you have to select before you call. That's not how it works, is it? Not in, the, not in the gospel sense. The call goes out, and then those who respond to it are referred to as the chosen. God has chosen to, to, to save those who respond to the call, right? Ephesians 1, that's, that's how that elect process works. But then called, chosen, and faithful means, yes, they responded in faith. They have to continue in that faith, right? Be thou faithful to death, remember 2 and verse 10. So there's that idea of called, chosen, faithful. All right, other stuff, chapter 17, you thought was interesting, yeah. I thought it was interesting, it's not necessarily about the chapter, but it's about, well, you read all the commentaries. 
and you've got like the seven mountains, mm -hmm. and they try to make that roam. And it's the French at best, but uh, I, I think it's just fascinating as you go through this. Sometimes the commentary is more confusing than Revelation itself. <laughs> and that's going somewhere. I've said this before, the Bible sheds light on commentaries a lot, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Matthew Henry is just off the wall. Oh, he's, yeah, he's in another planet. Yeah, on the, um, especially the... Well, and what's sad is when you read, like, Albert Barnes, he's... 95% of the time, pretty good. Yeah. I mean, in fact, he bothers Calvinists because he's not Calvinist. And they always put, well, this is a problem. But he goes off the rails, I mean, here. He's like, this is the Pope, this is the Roman Catholic Church, this is the Pope, you know, all, you know, all this stuff. The papacy. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But the other part of this chapter I think is really interesting is the fact that the beast, the beast turns on the woman. Yes. That's an interesting because you would think that they're they're together, they belong together, but then later here the the, the beast actually turns on the woman herself and devours the woman. Yeah. Do we know of something else in the natural world that maybe follows an organism around but then winds up killing it in the end? Like they're symbiotic, but then the one ends up killing the other? It's a parasite. Right? It's anything that's a parasite. I, and I have this later in the notes, but it's worth bringing up now. Evil always has to have a host. Right? Evil doesn't exist on its own. It's just evil has a host. What does evil wind up doing to its host? Killing it. And you see that in chapter 17, just like you said. The beast turns on the woman, and the woman has to pay for her allegiance, alliance with him. Right? So, exactly. The, the evil turns on its host. All right, um, we got time for one more. Or we don't. All right, that's fine. Um, other stuff you can see in Revelation 17. For one, as I mentioned earlier, heavy, heavy, heavy on Old Testament, both in structure and in the images that are used. One of them, I don't have time for all of these, but one of them you definitely should have a, a star, an underline, a note somewhere. is Jeremiah 51. Because, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting. Jeremiah 51, say, beginning around verse 6. Um, you know, oh, that's Jeremiah 50. That's why it doesn't make sense. Yeah, Jeremiah 51 in verse 6. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Let everyone save his life. Now, in this case, we're talking about Babylon, Babylon, like the capital of that empire. Be not cut off in her punishment, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, the repayment he is rendering her. Right? Babylon's a city. It's a female in this, in this instance. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making the earth all drunken. The nations drank of her wine, therefore the nations went mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail for her, so on and so forth. The idea that God would describe Israel's ultimate enemy as Babylon and use the cup imagery and the prostitution imagery, which is in other places, not a new thing, right? It's new to us, maybe, maybe because we're less familiar with that Old Testament stuff, but it wouldn't have been for unfamiliar to them, right? Plus, we studied Ezekiel 16 back when we talked about Ezekiel. Ezekiel 16 is the chapter where God describes Jerusalem. He describes his own capital city as a woman who was precious to him, given all kinds of precious stuff to wear, and given everything she could possibly hope for, and then what'd she do? Remember the story? She turned on him and played the harlot in two ways, a religious sense and a political sense. She took those things she had been given and used them to worship the idols and, their, and, and the nations that serve them. All right, so again, same, same imagery is being used here. Um, lots of threes in this chapter. There's three groups of people described. You have the harlot, you have the kings of the earth, and then you have those who are on the earth. We've seen those people before. Um, there's three references to harlotry or immorality. No matter what word your Bible uses, it's the same word in the Greek, porneia. It's where we get the word pornography from, right? It's that anything in that category. Um, actually, the word prostitute is actually the like female form of that word, right? That's a person who does that. You, you can kind of see why that would be called that way. We talked about this earlier. Evilness, evil is a, in the wilderness is an evil place. Uh, during the Day of Atonement ceremony where you had the two goats and you put the sins on the head of the goat, you remember what they did with one of them? Shuffled it off to the wilderness. 
to get rid of it forever was the idea, right? So it was seen as a wasteland, a, a, you know, the, the, the landfill. That's where you didn't want to be. We talked about this, the woman clothed with precious stuff that turns to whoredom. That's the way God talked about Jer Jerusalem in Ezekiel 16. Same things going on here. The numbers are symbolic in Revelation 17, as they are throughout the book. Right? The numbers mean things, and what they mean is not specifically what number it says. Right? Seven carries with a certain idea. Twelve carries an idea. Six carries an idea. Three carries an idea. You see that here in this chapter as well. We're going to talk more about it in a second. Verse 8. This is one I did want you to see. It says that the beast, at the end of verse 8, what does it say about the beast? It should sound vaguely familiar. The last line of verse 8, what does it say in your Bible? Beast what? Okay. It was and is not, but is to come. Now, does that sound like anything else you've read in Revelation? Something that was, and there's some reference to it being something now, and then some reference to it being, being a thing in the future. All right. Look at 1 and verse 8. When you see it, you're going to go, oh. Look at 1 and verse 8 in your Bible. What does it say there? Now, in 1 and verse 8, who's being talked about? God is, right? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord God says, or says the Lord God, who what, who is and who was and who is to come. Right? So there's, it's like, wait a minute. This thing in 17 is being described with language that's normally attributed to God. Um, if you look at 4 in verse 8, right? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Again, some kind of reference to this creature having some characteristic that's similar to God. In 13 and verse 3, there's a reference to the beast having a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed it. The idea here is that this beast in 17, it's the same one from chapter 13, by the way, it's a cheap imposter of what God and Jesus claim to be in truth. God and his son and the lamb both claim this title of being who was and is and is to come. This imposter, this other's force, comes in and says, well, I am too. I am the thing who was and is not and is to come. Right? And you see that in 13.3. It seemed to have been killed, but it wasn't. Okay? Just another reference to this idea of what it is. Um, if you associate with the harlot, and I'm putting associate in quotes, you mess with the harlot, you get what happens to the harlot, right? You know, this says in Proverbs, right? You know, can a man take fire in his bosom and not be burned? The obvious answer is no, right? You mess around with that, you're, you're going you're to find out what the deal is, okay? Now, I said this, and I wanted to make sure we're, we're good on this part. There are going to be things when you read Revelation that you go, I don't know. I just don't know. They're not going to affect your salvation. They're not going to be, you know, uh, you know I, I, I don't understand this one line of Revelation, so I'm going to throw the whole Bible out. That's not how that works. I right? heard an excellent sermon on Friday night. If you don't understand in Revelation some image, some line, it doesn't change the fact Jesus was raised from the dead. Right? There are going to be things that we read and we go, I just, I'm not sure. And sometimes it happens. And the Revelation is one of those places. I'll give you an example. Well, this isn't a great example, but this is a good place to see that the numbers are symbolic. In 17 and verse 9, it said that the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. When you identify who the woman is and you think about, okay, a, a woman or a city seated on seven hills, that sounds a lot like Rome because it was said to be that of Rome. Okay, Rome was always said to be a city founded on seven hills. And we see that and we go, oh, those two must go together. Just because there are two sevens and they have the same number of things doesn't necessarily mean they go together all the time. It's convenient, maybe coincidental, but it may not have anything to do with what you're talking about. When you look at the next line, you'll see why. Look at 17 and verse 10. This is a great place to see this point. It says, they are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is and the other has not come, 
And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. Now you're going through this going, okay, what on earth does it mean by that? If Rome is the kingdom here, and I think it is, Rome is the city, it's the harlot. you got seven kings, but five of them are dead, and one of them's alive right now, but then the next one won't live very long. Who are we talking about? If you try to figure this out literally, you wind up going in circles. And here's why. Because there's no good way to approach the list of Roman Caesars, or emperors, and come out with, I know exactly who this is talking about. Give you an example, all right? If you started counting Roman emperors based on who the Roman Senate said was an emperor, the Roman Senate never recognized Julius Caesar as emperor in their history, right? It's just some people did, the Romans did not. That would make the first Caesar Augustus, right? Well, if you count five down, you have five are dead and one is and one is yet to come. Well, number six on the list is Galba, 68 AD. You go, okay, great. Must be Galba that's being talked about. But if you ask Josephus, Jewish historian that was also a Roman, or Suetonius, another Roman historian, they reckon that the first emperor was Julius Caesar. So then what do you do? You back up to Julius and you count six, and the sixth one is Nero. Oh, cool, Nero persecuted Christians. That must be who we're talking about. What if you count emperors that were declared to be God by the Roman Senate? You see where we're going with this? There's like 47 different ways to approach counting the list of emperors and figuring out who's number six. Okay, if you count the ones that were deified by the Senate, then you wind up at Domitian. And Domitian's a, 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 it's an attractive one because we know he persecuted Christians and we have evidence that Revelation was written during his reign, so we're like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. If you say to yourself, well, you know, the death of Christ is a really, really important event. So important that basically everything started over. I mean, it was so important they started the years over, right? And they started counting at his death. If we count emperors since Jesus died, well, now we're at Vitellus. You see down here this list of three, Galba, Othello, Vitellus? There's a year in Roman history called the year of the four emperors. Within 12 months, four different people held the throne of, of, of emperor of, of, of Rome. A lot of infighting, this person would kill that person, this person's army would take over. One of them committed suicide. At the end of all the you know, moving and shaking, uh, Vespasian is the, wind up, is the one that winds up being emperor. So if you go, okay, we're going to throw out all those little guys that didn't really reign for very long. We're going to take the ones that really mattered. Well, it might be Vespasian, except it doesn't matter because who are you going to start counting with? See what I mean? Right? You, you really quickly wind up here. You get, you get my drift? Really quickly, when you take the literal numbers of Revelation and try to make them mean things, you wind up with just a mess. But Is there another one? Encyclopedia Britannica. Oh, said, there you go. Oh, let's go list the emperors. I, I was just going in similar way. There were I, in the first century. I just uh, I can't remember. There were thirteen different emperors. Right. In the second century, there were nine different emperors. So if you think those things shortly coming to pass, you have thirteen and nine. Yeah. So there you go. And there's not seven of them. There's like forty. Right. Different. I mean. Because Roman emperors actually went into the like 1000s. I mean, it got really kind of narrow there, but why did we wind up in the weeds? Because you took a number that was symbolic and tried to make it mean a literal thing. And when you do that, it doesn't, it doesn't line up. Okay. What can we say? Well, five of them are dead, one of them now, and one of them is to come. Are you closer to the end or the beginning? You're closer to the end. That may be the only thing you can say, right? It's been going on for a while. It won't go on much longer. Be the main point. Yes? Um, to make it more fun, Oh yes. I found a list of all the things that people think the seven mountains are. Oh, yeah. What on earth? <laughs> um, law, dichotomy, AI, cyber, political, religious, <laughs> education, science, and environment. Makes sense. Um, the seven continents. Okay. Um, Except Rome never existed on four of them, but okay. Right. <laughs> uh, 
Godless Empire, the Egyptian, Babylon, Greek, Persian, Assyrian. In the ancient Near East, okay. Okay. Yeah, did you, but that's the idea, right? It just, it starts getting weird mm -hmm. because we tried to make the text do a thing that it's not trying to do, right? And when you do that, you wind up with a mess. When you take it and you read it according to the symbolism that's been throughout this chapter or this book, then things are a lot more helpful. I've said this a couple of times. Who is the beast of Revelation 17? How does it compare to the one of chapter 13? I would make the argument that they're the same, right? And there's a couple of really important details. The beast in 13 and verse 1 has 10 horns and 7 heads. Same thing again, right? And again, not literal because you, I, how do you put 7 heads and 10 horns together? I mean, does one head have 3? Does, you know, is there 2 on one? Is it halves? I don't know, right? You try to make it do a literal thing, it, it doesn't work. But I think we're supposed to identify the one from 13 with the one from 17. They're the same. Right? In chapter 13, we said the first beast was the Roman Empire. Back when we talked about that. Now in 17, John, you know, by inspiration, is giving us the same image. The Roman Empire and the crown jewel on top of the Roman Empire would be Rome itself. Right? The city of Rome which fits all of the times God talked about wicked, evil cities in the Old Testament. It was always she, they were always harlots, right? Same things being done here. Who then's the woman? She's Rome itself, right? What sort of woman is Rome? I mean, is this someone you let your son date? <laughs> no. This is someone you tell your son, don't be there after dark. You've heard that before, right? Don't be in a certain neighborhood after dark. Don't be in Rome after dark, spiritually speaking, right? It's a terrible, wicked, evil place. Don't go there, right? That's, that's the idea here. What are the waters upon which the woman sits and what does this represent? There are moments, though, when the text tells us directly what the thing means. And that's helpful. That gets us back, you know, out of the weeds and back into the fairway and we get to know what's going on, right? In 17 and verse 15, the waters that you saw where the prostitutes seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. We've seen those phrases used before in Revelation. Right? It talks about the people in the world. Yeah. And again, it can't be literal because the number of waters doesn't match those other things that it represents. Yeah. I mean, and there, you talk about not, not being able to be literal. So, yeah, she is seated on many waters, but then she's seated on a beast. Like, which is it? Right? When you try to press it too much to make it mean a literal thing, it doesn't, it doesn't jive. Kind of like with the seventh bowl we talked about. How do you pour it into the air? It doesn't make any sense. Because it doesn't mean... It, it, the other thing that's interesting about the symbolism here, as you think about this, is that John is giving us the interpretation when there's nothing in the Old Testament, a lot of the examples that would help you to understand this. That is a good point. He's, he's not redundant. This is local to the, what the revelation is, so I'll, I'll give you the local here. The rest of it you can go get pr from previous images. Right, exactly. This is like take a test with your notes in school, right? Well, you got to go back and look and see. Here's what the things meant, you know, way back when. All right, um, what's the result for all those who war against the Lamb and the saints? You war against the Lamb and the saints, what happens? You lose, right? They make war on the Lamb. As David was mentioned earlier, this is kind of a, a summary statement for the whole book and its point. When you war against the Lamb and the saints, you die. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't happen. God's people are victorious in the end. Again, why would this be super helpful to the people it was written to? Because Rome has its royal thumb on top of the church trying to snuff it out. And there's the message. It's not going to work. This, this that you're fighting is evil and wicked and, and, and like, like, a, like a prostitute. But it's not going to win in the end. Right? God wins. Is again, the big point of the book. Why would the city be characterized as a harlot? And how is her harlotry, in the book I put different from, I realize that's a bad way of putting it. How is her harlotry compared to that of Jerusalem? Right? Why was Jerusalem, back in chapter 16 of Ezekiel, described as a harlot? What had she done to get such a title? What did God's people do to where God was very angry with them? They turned away from him and they worshipped idols. Why would the city of Rome be described in the same language? It's doing the same thing, right? And specifically, which thing are they doing? 
Like, which branch of idolatry have we talked about several times in the book? What, what have they tried to worship? The emperors. The emperors. They've actually turned to worship their own political system, in a sense. They held the emperors to be gods. That's a problem, right? Because there's only one God. They have turned to worship the emperor, and they've turned to make everything in their society centered around that idea. And so it makes sense when the city's being described, same language, right? Yes? Interesting, in order for them to be gods, they had to be infallible. And if you think about one other organization that puts a man at the top of the organization and makes him infallible, it's the, it's the Catholic Church. Interesting. I wonder where they got that idea yeah, from. Know. You know, I <laughs> heard a long heard a long time ago, you know, the Roman Empire didn't fall, it became a church. <laughs> it, it works, you know, it, it fits, you kinda, it kind of makes sense. All right, to the original audience, the very, what's so cool about this, and I said this back in Ezekiel, I said this in Daniel, the parts of the Bible that you read and you go, I don't know what's happening, right? When you sift through all the symbols and the stuff, the complicated parts of your Bible have the simplest messages. Like, the most basic ideas are the ones being broadcast. Right? This isn't Paul, you know, churning through faith in Romans. This is, there, there's very simple points to be made. What would a reader of this come away with and say? Yeah. There was a time when there was no persecution, then there was persecution, but there will be a time of no persecution again. Yeah. yeah. There's, there was, there was, you, you weren't persecuted before. You are now. That's gonna. That you're gonna be okay, but then there's more. There's more to come, right? This isn't gonna be the only problem the church goes through. Now, to them, they couldn't look back on their history and go, "Oh yeah, I remember the Crusades and I remember the Restoration. And I remember all." The they couldn't do that. So they were told by God, "Look, what you're going through now, you're gonna go through. You're gonna live through. You're gonna be fine." Ultimately speaking, but then there's gonna be other things that happen. Right? Which, if you think, didn't God say that to Israel over and over again? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what God did with his people. Yes, you're going through a thing now. It's going gonna, it's gonna to end one day, but then there's other stuff coming. Same idea. Yeah. I'm just thinking this works on a lot of levels, too. If you're an individual Christian, you may not live through the persecution, mm-hmm. but it's going to be okay. But you think of someone who was, I'm sure at this time there were people who worried, will there even be Christians in a hundred years? Mm-hmm. You know, are they going to win and completely stamp this out? Yep. He says, no, it's going to be okay. And it works on all of those levels. Not the first time that's happened either in biblical history, right? Elijah asked that question. Yep. Where he said, I'm the only one left. God says, no, you're not. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it kept going. Mm-hmm. Um, did you have, no? I thought I... I saw a a stretching. I scratched my nose. Ah, careful. (laughs) How dare you? Uh, I always said when I taught, listen, if the arm hits 90 degrees, you're answering your question, right? (laughs) Keep it in here. All right. Uh, Others? Yes. If you look at that, what Dennis said, you you look biblically, regardless of what the circumstances were, there was always a remnant. And, you know, I think... Historically, we've been taught that, oh, you know, the Dark Ages, the church was totally... No, it wasn't. No. No, it wasn't. There, there's always... Dark just means not illuminated, right? Right. Because we don't know. It doesn't mean it wasn't there. Somewhere, somehow, right? Exactly. Um, I said this, in, this was one of my questions that kind of led into this part of the discussion. How would this provided comfort and assurance to John's readers? Right. What would they read this and com- what would comfort them in this section? Right. We talked about one already, verse 14. The Lamb will conquer them and those with them are called chosen and faithful and, and so on. Right. So they're going to win. Okay. Other things that you could see might comfort. Yeah. Well, we know they're going to turn on each other. So that's encouraging because if they're turning on each other, they're not turning on you. Yeah. Yeah. The evil's going to take, <laughs> evil's kind of going to take care of itself. Right. Right. It's going to implode. And, and go from there. Um, yeah, so the people that are doing the things that they are concerned with in their day and time, right? The Roman Empire, really with Rome as its head, they're the ones causing all the problems for the Christians in this area at this time. And God's not going to allow that to go undealt with. 
right? It's not just, well, just, just you know, be okay and I'll, I'll deal with it when I deal with it. No, he will deal with it, right? You're, you're writing to people who had family who had been killed for their faith, right? Imagine reading this in, let's say, Ephesus or, or wherever it was read, and you're reading this and the guy next to you lost his, his or her husband to one of these persecutions, right? Or you remember when this was being read, my friend that was just here, they're not around anymore because of Rome, right? Rome hauled them off to prison and Rome killed them. You're, you're a group of people that are looking for justice to be done. And this chapter tells you it will be done, right? It will be dealt with. So there's a, there's a comfort there, I think, in, in knowing that. Um, we've said this already, evil has a host. It has to have a host, right? Currently, the host is Rome. In the past, it had been Babylon. In the past before that, it had been Assyria. In the past before that, it had been Egypt. There's always a host. And it always gets destroyed, and it's always taken up by someone else, right? Power, you know, nature hates a vacuum, so does political power. Someone always steps in. And that someone always seems to cause problems for God's people. It is what it is. That's, that's, that's the world they live in, right? And that's, that it's recognizing that fact. The idea that just God wins. If we're on his side, it will be okay. If you follow Christ, if you obey the gospel, if you're faithful to death, as it said in chapter 2, you will be on the winning side of things. Okay. Like I said, God's going to do what he's done with everyone else. Right? Every other quote-unquote city of evil, every other Babylon that's ever been, never been, he will deal with them in, in, in his time. And so back to our point from earlier, don't be afraid that Rome's going to beat the church. Right. Jesus said something to that effect, right? Matthew 16 about whether or not the church would stand. Remember that? The gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Exactly. On this rock I will my church. What's the rock? The idea that Jesus is the Messiah. When that's done, nothing will, will prevail against it. Right. And so this is just another version of that. Okay. Um, what would it mean to you and I? Oh, let's do that first. What can we take from this? All right, we talked a lot about the, these Christians and their time and their Roman problem, what they're dealing with. What can we take from this chapter that's in the same vein of thinking? Yeah. Power corrupts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> one, one lesson here about human nature. Yep. It always goes this direction, right? Nation, or empires never go up for very long. They peak and then they, you know, and as they're coming down, they tend to find a reason or a people to oppress as they do so. And it, it winds up being the people of God. Well, right? yeah. Our, we're in decline not because of what we did, but because of those people. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. When a nation or a city or whoever turns away from God, what winds up, you know, wind up being destroyed by the evil they chose to adopt. Mm -hmm. Every time. That's the process. And so we, you know, wring our hands and look at the political system and go, well, why, why is everything so broken? It's being run by people. And this is what people do. They turn away from God. And when that happens, they you know, inevitably wreck the, wreck the thing they've tried to do. Every time this happens. All right, other stuff that you and I can take from the chapter and, and come away with. Yeah. This may be a little out for lunch. But well, we're in Revelation, so it's, I mean, it happens. <laughs> it made me think when I was reading this. Uh, I read an article the other day about Christian nationalism, which mm. is this you know, growing thing, and kind of the dangers of that. And um, they, they have even, I mean, this movement, they even have their own Bible now oh dear. that connects everything to whatever. But anyway, it, it made me think when I was reading this, you know, just like when Christ came, when, when he sent his son, and the Jews were anticipating this major earthly kingdom and mm -hmm. somebody on a white horse is going to come in and overthrow and mm -hmm. and that didn't happen and you know in this case you never see you never see the angel telling john this is how we're going to deal with this the church is going to raise up mm -hmm. rise up and we're going to defeat rome on their own terms you know we're going to become warriors basically yep. and you never see that and that's a lesson i think that a lot of people could learn today evidently yeah 
Revelation is concerned with exactly one victory. Yeah. Right? Everything else up to that is just details. And what they're being told is everything else up to that doesn't matter because Jesus is king, right? God still reigns, and he's going to win, and that's, you have to put your faith in that. All the rest of it, whatever happens, even if they die, that's still the one thing's being worried about, right? You know, if, we're, if we're concerned with that, then that, that should take, that should take <laughs> our focus. Um, that should be our focus. All right. Um, all right. When you're going through persecution, you've got to remember you know, what side you're on. Because what, what's the primary temptation of persecution? How do you get out of persecution? You recant your faith. Right? That was, that, that's the way the Japanese eradicated Catholicism from Japan. They said, well, if we can get them to just say they hate Mary or whatever, then, then they're good, right? That's the, that's the primary temptation under persecution is to recant your faith. And worse, if you do, and well, you know, maybe a, 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 bump, a bump benefit in some sense, now you get to go be Roman and not have to worry about all this, right? So there's a positive sort of slant to it, except when you remember, when you go along with the woman, what happens? You're judged for it. You're judged along with her. Right? Don't abandon your faith to go live with Babylon right? and go associate with her and then forsake Christ. Right? Which bride do you want to be with is sort of the question 18, 19, or 17, 18, 19, 20 ask you. Which bride do you want to be with? you want to be with the bride of Christ or you want to be with the bride of, of Satan? And you might describe her there. Um, Babylon's had a lot of different iterations. In this case, Babylon is Rome. In later cases, Babylon, or the lesson, the principle from this could be applied to other places and other situations. I think that's what we're supposed to do with it. Take the principles that we are taught here from this particular instance and bring them into our own time. Right? Like we said, Matthew 16, 18, the kingdom will stand. What is telling in this chapter, and we haven't really talked much about this, just how bad it sounds to be Babylon. Right? Right? This is, this is the line that, that gets it for me. In, in verse 4, the latter half of verse 4, verse, sorry, Freudian slip, latter half of verse 4, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the <laughs> impurities of her sexual immorality. That's gross. That's bad. Like, that's beyond disgusting, right? It's interesting, in the Greek, abomination it, 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 the root of it is, is something that smells horrible. It, literally, when you go back and you look at it, it's something that really, really stinks. That's, that's, a, that's an abomination, the, the original word for it. Right? Whatever is this is going on, this is awful. She reeks. Why would you want to go be a part of that? But people do. right? People have. Nations, kings, cities, People have gone and joined with her, even though it stinks to high heaven. Right? There's a choice you have to come up with. Which one are you going to pick? Are you going to see the vile thing you're getting into? Or you know, are you going to follow Christ? This is a woman in verse 6. What is she drunk with? Whose blood? Innocence. Not just blood. It's the blood of innocent Christians. That's how bad this is. Right? Not just drunk on blood. You're not just a vampire. right? You're, you're drunk on the blood of... Now, obviously this isn't literal, but the point it's making is very serious. This is sin, and this is what happens when you're involved in it. It's as if you're drinking the blood of innocent saints. What will God do to the one who drinks the blood of innocent saints? What won't he do might be a question. Right? All right. Oh, bother. I don't have time to get to the thing at the end. That's really sad because I wanted to. I'll bring it up next week. Because right. it, it works. It was, a, it was our connection to, connection to modern day. All right. Next week, if you'll remind me, I'll try to remember. I'll go back and do the thing at the end of 17 I was going to do. And then we'll talk about 18 as well. Um, 18 is one of those chapters that when you go back and you read Ezekiel, you'll realize, oh, yeah, this has already been done once before. Right? The judgment against the city of Tyre in Revelation, I can't remember the chapter, or Ezekiel, that's the the image here. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to talk more next week on this.